OMG, OMG, OMG. Welcome to OMG, the Omara Gale radio show. I'm your host, actress, author, evangelist, and content creator. And I'm going to cut straight to the chase. Today's conversation is about vulnerability. I've got six of my good girlfriends who expose the truth in order to help you heal. So listen up and eavesdrop on the conversation I had with my friends, Avis Files, Tasha Jackson, Sharon Dyer, Monica Miller, Rhonda Fleming, and Crystal January. So <laughs> I'm excited because this conversation on vulnerability and shame, I feel is a very necessary conversation. So I'm just gonna toss the first question out and, uh, and I'll allow the ladies, whichever one feels most comfortable responding to this question right off the bat. So, so one of the things that I wanted to ask is, um, in the book, Brene Brown's book, Daring Greatly, she talks about how we start wearing a mask or armor at a very early age. So I wanna know, uh, do you, any of you, uh, recall when you may have first started wearing the mask or putting up the armor? And if so, tell us a little bit about what that was like. You know, I could, well, I could jump in right away because I know right off the top of my head. <laughs> I've uh, shared this a little bit uh, before, but when I grew up, I grew up with kids saying that I sounded like a white girl. Mm -hmm. And so I always felt like my friends, it, it was just like, I, honestly, right off the bat, as soon as I met someone new, the first question was, so are you raised around a lot of white people? And do you have white friends? And, and I began to feel like I couldn't be myself or I had to be very conscientious of being myself when I was meeting new people, because I just didn't want to get that question over and over again. So I began to shrink down um, sometimes how I spoke mm -hmm. and I tried to, I tried to change the way I talked. I tried to morph into something that I thought was more acceptable yeah. by my peers so that I wouldn't stand out as someone who is different. Yeah. And it just, it wound up translating into all different spaces. As you get older, you learn that defense mechanism. You learn when you kind of get confronted with people that question things about you to kind of morph a little bit so that it's more acceptable and it's yeah. more socially acceptable to where sometimes you begin to wonder, well, which one is the real me? Yeah. Mm. Mm. Haven't we all felt that? I mean, yeah. haven't we all felt like yeah. we've had to shrink adjust, recalibrate in order to exist in being who we were naturally created to be. It's, it's, it's one of those things that uh, society puts on us and we've all experienced it in one way or another. Who wants to kind of chime in on this? And the reason that we're doing this and allowing our <sighs> listeners to understand that no matter where you come from, if you come from the ghetto or the suburb or affluent uh, uh, family household, this is a common thread in all people. And so it's good to unpack it because I believe that our listeners will be able to understand and recognize how their children do it, how their spouses do it, and, and how it shows up on their job because some people still wear those masks. So who wants to get in next? I'll jump in. I, I remember doing it um, from kindergarten. Um, mm -hmm. I explained to the kindergarten teacher that I had already heard the story. And she said to me, let's pretend like Avis is not here. Mm -hmm. um, I actually at five left kindergarten and was walking home. They didn't know where I was. They had to call my mother and say, where is she? Cause I was like, pretend like I'm not here. Deuces. I can um, just not be here. <laughs> I can just not be here. I'm good on that. And so I've worn that. And so I am always like, my voice is here. My voice isn't present and I'm never absent. And I'm, mm. I'm still that way. Mm, mm. Love that. Love that you took ownership of, of if you're going to pretend I'm not here, I'm really not going to be here because you knew in, in some part of you that wasn't right. 
and and that wasn't uh, what re respectful of your time and your presence. But most kids at that age wouldn't have made that choice. Mm -hmm. They would have sat there in that shame and or embarrassment, and they would have allowed those words to rest on them. And the opposite probably would have happened where they would have been invisible in rooms, invisible when they were with their friends. So kudos to you. And Absolutely. we know you to be bold <laughs> and to be brave. And we are yes, glad right. that even right. at that age, you yes. knew who you were. Yeah. Hallelujah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> who else wants to get in on this? Um, Mara, mine is more uh, like the in the shame category because I was always, I've always been uh, the chunky girl, heavy, right? Even when I was a little bitty girl. And um, uh, there were always these names that were given to me. I've had pudgy and little heavy and all of these names in such endearing ways. But the thing for me was, it was kind of confusing because of the fact that society at the time wasn't endearing, not at that age, at that time, back in the 70s. Um, society was not endearing towards heavy people at all. So um, in school, especially in elementary school, I would be teased um, about my size, um, little jokes, little, um, you know, pics and things like that about, you know, how I was heavy. So there was, um, there was this conflict because at home, those, those types of words, those types of nicknames came from home and I viewed them as endearing. But then mm -hmm. when I got out in public, it wasn't, it didn't feel good. Right. And so I developed this thing of just never, like even now I hate to go shopping because mm -hmm. when I went shopping, there was always the ugly, they got bad clothes now for big girls, right? <laughs> but when I was a little girl and went shopping, it was always the fluffy, flowery, ugly dresses and all of that stuff. So I, I developed this habit of covering everything up. So I wore sweatshirts and jeans a lot just so that people would not see my body. So it was kind of like a body shame kind of thing. And, and it lasts because I mean, even into my adulthood and even sometimes now um, that is, you know, prevalent in my mind. So it's just always an effort to have that self-love to overcome those types of issues. Yes, and that's very important. If we don't counteract what voice is talking to us the loudest, if we don't uh, smash down and squash the Debbie Doubter, uh, mm -hmm. if, we don't, if we don't kill that, that spirit of self-sabotage and, 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 and all the negative talk, we can find ourselves in a situation where that's the voice that speaks the loudest all the time. Absolutely. And it's amazing how mm -hmm. in your home, you, you felt it as endearing, but when you went out into the world, you realized there was bite behind that. Mm -hmm. um, and we mm -hmm. learned that at an early age and it's good to learn hard. It, but it's, but it's in, in, in what you said, Monica, it's hard because it is dying daily to that, right? It's just mm -hmm. like when we have to die daily to whatever our challenge is, in this same reality, whatever our struggle is or whichever voice is speaking the loudest, we have to know how to put that in the back of our brain instead of allowing that to be our forethought. You know, otherwise we'll self-sabotage. Crystal, go ahead and jump on in there. Yeah, I was just gonna say, it's, it's good to hear everyone's um, experiences and I can relate to all of them. So um, as Monica was saying, you know, when you speak a certain way, you're trying to be white or if you're trying to do well in school, you're trying mm -hmm. to be white, right? Um, the same thing though with Rhonda, I've, I've also experienced other pieces of that. Mm. Um, my mother is a heavy set woman, but when people see me, they would naturally just assume that, you know, oh, you're small because, you know, you must come from a family of small people, right? We eat and we eat well. The point is this, <laughs> I mean, love it. And to this day, it's like, no, and, 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 and you have those same things. So I've watched her struggle and battle with weight and I carry that. And then, so as a girl growing up with that, then I become more health conscious, which could be good, which could be bad, right? And then if you're smart or you're, you're a professional or you get into a career, then you run into the thing of, well, you don't want to be the pretty girl because surely she got that position because she's a pretty girl, right? Not because mm. she's a hard worker, not because she's good mm. at it, not because she has a brain. So then you develop these masks where now you're suited and booted and all covered and completely covered where you don't even necessarily look like a lady because God forbid I'm pretty, you know, this is going to be bad. Mm. 
And I mean, I hate to even throw this last little piece out there, but there's also the piece within the race where there is the whole, are you light complected or are you oh, dark yeah. complected? And who gets the rougher chime and who gets Speak the this it. and who's black enough? So it gets really interesting in terms of the mask that we juggle to fit into the different environments. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Can everybody say amen to that? Amen. 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 Yeah. Constantly, we're constantly, we have a, okay, everybody who knows me and, and I keep it 100 on this show. Everybody who knows me knows I have a plethora of wigs. They're my friends. They're like hats. I love yeah. them. And <laughs> I'm cute too. Thank you very much. <laughs> we have a plethora of masks, an assortment, a variety yes. that we mm -hmm. put on. And we know which masks to wear when we are yeah. here, there, mm -hmm. and everywhere. We yeah. don't mix them up. We never get them confused. And we're always sure to put on the appropriate mask in the, in the place or the setting that we're in. Does anybody else yeah. want to talk on this particular uh, subject or this question, I should say, before we jump to the next one? Just to add a maybe a different um, a layer to this, um, being an immigrant mm -hmm. and like Crystal relating to all the stories where I have had to dumb down my accent because I received mm -hmm. ignorant comments about growing up on the beach and smoking weed and living in huts and, mm -hmm. and being wow. skinny all my life for real, right? And coming to find out that was a compliment in America, where in Jamaica that, that they like their women plump, right? Mm -hmm. So I struggled, I had these complexes with my weight and having to figure out, you know, where do I fit in? But you mentioned something about knowing when to put the mask on. And I felt like that's something I had to learn in a very jarring way. I have very vivid memories of going to work with my natural hair and people not knowing what to do with it and mm. having to figure mm. out in hindsight, things shifted because people got uncomfortable um, mm. in leadership or, and I can put my finger on very, uh, very distinct moments in my career where I felt like the moment I became more real, it made people uncomfortable. I remember being called um, erudite at mm. one position. Um, wow. And I remember just being in tears because here I am tasked with an assignment to communicate and to interpret and to digest it and distill it and then regurgitate it to folks who are scholarly who should be able to interpret what I'm saying but because of my position and the, who the messenger was it made them uncomfortable and I remember being in my office crying and just wow. felt like the Holy Spirit was take, telling me take that and run with it okay I will be brave enough to be the very thing that you called me so I'm going to study even harder. Mm. I'm going to make sure I communicate this even more effectively for you. But just recognizing, um, yes, there are those masks, but being brave enough to unveil them and be comfortable, regardless of the response yeah. that you receive. Mm -hmm. mm, that's so mm. real and that's so true. If you can learn to counteract that negativity that people put on you, right. you it. will be the most courageous thing. That reminds me of um, a quote that Brene Brown actually made about when you actually share vulnerability, it is one of the most courageous things that you can actually do. Um, she, she quoted, uh, what was this, Theodore Roosevelt. And you guys remember this in the book. Mm -hmm. She says, and that's where the whole title came from, Daring Greatly. Mm -hmm. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points mm -hmm. out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again because there is no effort without error and <clears throat> shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement and who at the worst if he fails yes. at least fails while daring greatly mm -hmm. um and what's so powerful about that is you got to get in the arena yeah you got to get scared yes. you got to sometimes get hurt or bruised in order to feel and be present 
and be made aware. Tasha, did you want to get in on this this question? Man, you know, you know, that's my quote. I I just love it. And I and I and then I th- I thought about uh, where she talks in her book about just showing up, showing up, and letting yourself be seen, right? And when I think about that, you know, it requires you to take off that mask. It requires you to be be uh, vulnerable. And you think about that show Jim Carrey was in the mask. And when that mask got a hold of his face and whenever he tried to pull it off, it was like sticking to him like super glue or something. And that's how that feels, you know, to, 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 to try to get that mask off so that you can show up. But, and, that's, and it does take courage and it does take strength and it does take yeah. vulnerability. But for me, it has been sort of the journey of my life just to say whatever I am in, I'm going to show up, I'm going to give it everything I got, and that may not be good enough, and that's okay too, right? And it's it's even what I'm telling myself now in the work that I do now and everything that I do now, because there's always this message in the back that says, Tasha, it's not good enough. Tasha, you're not good. Tasha, you're going to figure it out. You yeah. probably shouldn't even be at this table, right? Yeah. And that's yeah. okay because those messages says, okay, well, I'm going to give everything I've got and that is good enough. I'm going to show up and I'm going to leave it all on the table. And I think I got so that from you, let me Bless you. Let me ask this though, Tasha, when did it start? And when did you first identify when you were younger that it was present? Because there's a reason that 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 it's influenced now, and you're bold and you're courageous. But it started someplace w- when you were younger. So, do you recall maybe when it started? And if so, how did it present itself? Well, you know, I was a I, I was a teen mom. I've talked about this being on your show before. I had my uh, first child when I was 15 years old, right? Mm-hmm. And just imagine all the shame that comes yeah. along with that, right? Yeah. And so for me, it was always this sense of, uh, of that hanging over my head. Um, but I knew that there was something that was in me. And I, I really attribute it to my father, who mm-hmm. always said to me, Tasha, there is nothing that my father made me feel like there was absolutely nothing that I was incapable, that I was uh, oh, I capable it. of doing. Even in the fact, even knowing that, you know, I was a teen mom, he said that you can't let that stop you. He's the first person that told me, because I'm 15 now, he's the first person that told me, Tasha, you can go to college. Mm. He was like, and there are great, he told me there are great, no school counselor was telling me, Mm. sorry, Rhonda, but my school counselor did (laughs) not tell me, (laughs) Tasha, you can go to college. It was my dad who said, Tasha, there are grants and there are scholarships that can help you. This is so you can do that. So my father kept saying, you know, I'm hearing and I'm thinking, you're not good enough. You can't. Nobody's telling, but my father kept saying, you are, you can, you will, yeah. you are, you can. Yeah. You will. And, and at some point, I just start believing it because he said, right. what's the worst they mm-hmm. can say? No. And so I always look, what's the worst that, that somebody can tell me is no. And then guess what? Then I'll just ask somebody else. And so <laughs> I really think it was my father who helped me uh, overcome that. Yes. And exactly. reprogram. Deprogram. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I think you need that. Kids need that the, to hear that over and over and over and over. You can, yeah. you will, and you should. Mm. And I'm sure being a, uh, a teenage mom and all that can come with that and the embarrassment, the shame and the, and the things, the labels that people put on you, you had to have your dad reinforce that again and again and again, because it wouldn't have been good enough for him to say it one time. No. Because one time does not counteract the 50 stares that you get when you walk into a classroom or if you have to go to an alternative school, all of those things yeah. bring with it two sets of eyes on each person, two sets of eyes on each teacher. And then you have the community, the neighborhood, you have the church. And and then it's overwhelming. It's as if it's a million people looking at you saying, exactly. look at her, she ain't going. But your dad was a constant reminder of what, what you became, because that's why we know you as an achiever, as yeah. an accomplisher, as a leader, because you set your chart to dispel all of that. And we are proud yeah. that you mm-hmm. overcame that and were able to march valiantly. Uh, Monica, I know you had a question. Go ahead and, and come on in, sweetheart. Well, it was more of a comment and it was just really thinking about what Tasha was saying. So interestingly enough, a lot of my own issues with um, shame or like masking and feeling like I had to mask, they're more internal. 
than mm. external, right? Mm. So Tasha dealt with the fact that she had this external thing that people could see. Yeah. I think sometimes it also is, um, it's very difficult when you, sh- when you have internal struggles like anxiety and like that over-processing and overthinking. As mm-hmm. I've said to the group, I will think back on a conversation that I've had with someone <laughs> And I was like, why did I say that? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I said that. What was I thinking? And like, we'll over-process the mess out of a conversation and begin to then second guess myself, you know, uh, in situations because it's just an internal battle and it almost feels like it's not present or it's not real. Like you, you almost want to diminish the fact that this is happening because it's like, well, I remember having a friend tell me, you don't have issues like I have issues. Yeah. You have p- two parents that you grew up with and, you know, you, your, your household is pretty stable. You, you're like the Cosby's, like you don't yeah. have issues. And oh yeah, oh, I still have my own issues. I still have my own struggles. I still have my own insecurities. Yeah. And I think what you said, um, how, what happens, at, it, it's somewhere along the line, there has to be some, some level of self-acceptance. And for me, it was that, you know, my favorite phrase, I am enough. Yeah. And it was when I really took hold of that, yeah. like took hold of that phrase and really understood, no, I am enough. Yeah. But and until then, it, you're, it's, a, it's a playground in here. It, it's a playground. And, and that is a very poignant point, two, two points in that, that I literally, I'm gonna, we're going to unpack the I'm enough a little bit later in the show. But mm-hmm. one of the other points is people look at you and your situation, and they come up with judgments about what you aren't dealing with, what your struggles are not, and how their struggles are always bigger or bolder or present themselves in a different way than yours. And that's because no one knows what we really struggle with because we're effective mask wearers. And Mm -hmm. so the reason people never knew you were struggling, Monica, is because you knew where to wear your mask and how to wear your mask, and you weren't wearing vulnerability or shame on your sleeve. Let me segue a little bit. Brene Brown says, shame is a powerful emotion that can cause people to feel defective, unacceptable, and even damaged beyond repair. And at one point she says that you just feel like you want to sink and disappear, right? Mm -hmm. And so so I want to ask a question. Uh, If a few of you can share and tell me uh, a time that you may have felt shame and want it to just disappear. You no longer want it to be present. If you could go to an island and be there and no one knew you or just disappear out of a room, like just turn into Casper the ghost and go away. Has anybody ever felt that? Mm. Yeah, that's good. I mean, <laughs> so I, remember, I remember a time when I was, the first thing that sticks out to my mind, uh, I grad, I graduated from high school and I was um, applying to go to college. No, actually I was still in high school and I was, uh, um, you know, you do all the paperwork uh, to get ready to go to college. And I wanted to go to a four year university. Mm-hmm. And I remember meeting with this, this um, gentleman at this place who, uh, was, you know, they help you fill out the applications and stuff. I forget. It was some nonprofit organization that just worked with people like me, right? Teen moms, people like me. And he told me, he just flat out told me, you shouldn't, no, you can't, you can't go to a four-year university. He said, you should go to the, the technical school. Cause he's like, there's a good chance this will be too difficult for you and you're not going to be able to finish. Mm. And, you know, just said some other things. And I, it was so, you know, and he's saying that to me because, you know, I'm young and I have a baby, you know, and this is way back. I had, what was it, 1980? When was Ashley born? 1985, 80s. <laughs> you know, we don't involve, we deal with teen moms every day. Girl, you going to college, you know. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Don't get you there. Exactly. Yes. But back then it was like, now I'm coming off this, 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 you know, even in my own family, it wasn't, you know, then like you had a baby, you, you dropped out of high school, you did your GED. I refused to drop out of high school, refused and was encouraged. 
um, you know, to, to drop out, you know, go ahead and just do your GD. I was like, absolutely not. I'm going to finish high school. And I struggled. I struggled through high school. Mm-hmm. So then I get to here and this guy is telling me, no, you, you should really consider. And didn't, he didn't say don't go to college, but consider a two-year program. And right. whether he was right or not, there was going to be struggle in that because I had to work and be a parent. But it's yeah. just the way that he put it out there that made me feel like, nothing yeah like I've made this big mistake and now I'm gonna just just pay I'll never be able to really accomplish too much of anything because of it and I just wanted to you know just disappear if I can I I really feel like I need to redeem myself as a high school counselor (laughs) because of the fact that Tasha had such a horrific experience with these adults in her life (laughs) back in the day I am currently a high school counselor and just kind of to take a, a, a different um, outlook on it um, as she was talking about her experience, um, the the number of students that come in, Tasha knows this herself, she's an educator as well, as well as Monica, um, the number of students that come in and have these very issues, the, the things that they are dealing with and we have to constantly reinforce because when they go home, they hear something different. When they're out in Absolutely. the street, they hear Absolutely. something different. Absolutely. And so I, I wanted to uh, bring this out because of the fact that a lot of times they have these issues because of the fact that their parents are the ones who are, you know, struggling with things. Mm-hmm. And that carries over to the child. Mm-hmm. And they then adopt at these young teenage ages and before that, you know, they're not worthless, they can't do certain things. And that's not all parents. I don't want to just, right. you know, say that. Not a blanket, but, but it's, 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 it's prevalent. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. and the, the importance of being able, I appreciate you for doing this because all these different perspectives helps, people are going to watch this and yeah. hopefully somebody will uh, recognize the fact that you have to deal with your stuff. Yeah. You have to deal with your stuff because we are affecting not even just the, the people that are in our homes, but the people that we are, you know, come in contact with, with every day. Yes. Yeah. As a school counselor, if I didn't deal with my stuff, yes. I would carry that information on and those insecurities on to my students yes. and they would not go on to be, you know, as yes. great as they could possibly be. Absolutely. I'm glad you spoke on that because I think another one of the things, and I hope our listeners understand that the reason we unpack a lot of this is because when, if, if we open up ourselves and show you where we've erred or where we've had struggle or challenge, then prayerfully, you can identify those steps, those moments, and not influence your children, as, as Rhonda was just saying, because we, what, a person will limit you based on what they think they can do. Mm-hmm. And, and that's always a situation when, when you have a limited pers- My mother, for example, told me uh, when I was about to go to college that I shouldn't go to college because um, I'll get pregnant. Because mm-hmm. my sister, both of my sisters who had went to college had gotten pregnant, one when she was in high school and one when she went to college. And so she just put that label on me and told me no. Uh, go to technical school, like Tasha mm-hmm. was saying. And mm-hmm. what's interesting about that is I pulled an Avis and was like, no, that's not who I am. That's not what I want to do. I'm going to go to college. Deuces. I'm going. And right. ended up preparing to go to college without her even knowing. Literally had packed, had applied to school, had gotten accepted. And it wasn't until she walked in my room and saw the footlocker in the middle of the floor that she knew <laughs> I was going to college. Right. That was how bold your girl was because I had mm. did a rap album that had given me money that I could go to college. Curtis Blow, thank, thank you very much. Um, but nonetheless, I say that because we will put that on somebody else mm-hmm. and it doesn't even fit them, but we've mm-hmm. made them wear it. And it can start as young as a two-year-old or a three-year-old or a five-year-old if we're not careful. I want to, I wanna, um, if anybody else wants get in on it and I'll let you get in on the question and then I'll switch gears a little bit because I really want to dive deep or unpack a little bit more of what the shame is how it makes us feel and then Mm. how do we move past the feeling of shame Mm. um, and and, and why it rests on us the way that it does so so the question again was about telling me a time that you felt shame and wanted to disappear 
We're going to put a pin in this conversation for now and pick it up in part two, where the ladies will begin to tell us a time where they felt so much shame they wanted to just disappear. We've all had to deal with our insecurities, and we're also going to discuss how men process vulnerability and shame in a whole different manner. Yes, we're going to unpack all of that and so much more. So tune in, lean in, and listen up at Up to me radio.com that's up the number two me radio.com search omg my show page and be sure to subscribe so that you'll be alerted when my shows are airing you can also catch my podcast wherever you listen to podcasts till next time be blessed mm-hmm.